Today, Dundalk TV is with Chris Cockerell, and we are in Annapolis and getting ready to testify on a concussion bill. And the bill number was HB 1210. Um, it's a uh, concussion related bill to, uh, related to youth sport uh, in particular. Um, it's to actually um, ban youth tackle football up to age of 14 and to modify soccer hockey and lacrosse. Hockey and lacrosse will be modified in the sense that body checking will now be uh, banned and, and soccer uh, heading will no longer be allowed. Uh, up to a certain age with the yes, heading? The, the, the range that they're putting it at uh, is eight to 14, but I'm sure that anything prior to eight years old would, and in most cases from uh, my experience uh, with various boys clubs and girls clubs for that matter, um, Typically, they, they don't allow heading anyway um, at such an early age, so um, I don't think that would be an issue. So what do you think about these bills? Um, I think it's long overdue. Um, again, a little bit about myself. I've been a youth football coach for uh, nearly 25 years, actually beyond youth. I've actually coached at the high school and college level, um, but the, the majority of my coaching experience has been at the youth level. And pretty much since this um, issue with, with head injuries and things of that nature uh, became such a, a hot topic, um, we'll say 10 years ago, um, from my experience you know, with the landscape, uh, it's been, been very underwhelming with the, the absence of leadership and how they've gone about um, trying to deal with this situation. And I can get into specifics about that as well. Well, I talked to coaches quite a while ago and was trying to fill them in um, because I am a traumatic brain injury survivor. I've been studying things like you have and trying to tell them about different things like baseline testing. And they said, oh, we have it together. They kept telling me how together they had it. Then the uh, Baltimore County Parks and Recs instituted new concussion protocols and they're like oh my goodness we're doing this we're doing this and I'm like are you doing baseline testing yet and they're like no we're not doing that yet I said you're not there yet but they still couldn't understand what I was talking about they thought that they knew what was going on and they had everything um, covered that, that there was no problem and that uh, they were doing everything correctly and that the athletes were safe and, and I can tell you that is not true uh, wasn't then and isn't now because I know that the majority of doctors out there do not understand traumatic brain injuries and they will tell you they do and then all of a sudden your child is released to go back to play and this is what I talk about to other other people as I did you earlier is that it comes down to a lot of personal responsibility because when that doctor releases you they if they give you the wrong diagnosis your child could die just be by hitting hit one time that, that's it, and um, you don't want to you don't want to go through that. And there could be other issues too that the uh, that your child also deals with uh, severe traumatic brain injury and is not able to ever get back to any kind of normal life once again. So um, please tell us. Uh, you you had a lot of great information about the um, the football stories that you were talking about. Uh, your absolutely. experience. And, and to, to get to your point too, I'll even take it a, a step further in that showing you how far back we truly are at the at the youth level um, beyond the baseline testing typically uh, again the the information that's provided um, through the leadership is that if a child or if a parent of a child wants to have their child baseline tested they can certainly take that upon themselves um, they they generally have it as a you know a mild recommendation uh, not by no means is it a requirement to to do that, but even even with that being the case, I've seen time and time again um, where the 2012 uh, Zach Listet law in Maryland has been completely ignored, where players are being hurt, they go down, the play stops, the coaching staff goes out to uh, evaluate them. It's clear by the hit that the injury that's occurred is either to the neck or head. And, you know, they, they just make excuses as to why they put the kid back in the game. He showed no symptoms, um, this, that, and the other thing, which, again, is completely irrelevant to what the law states. The law states that if a player is hurt, injured, sustains a head, neck, or con a head, head, neck injury, or a concussion, not just a concussion, a head, neck injury, or a concussion, 
they must come out of the game. They must be evaluated by a trained professional. They must have a written notification by that individual to return to play. And I can tell you right now, worst case scenario is you see a player getting hurt and three or four plays later he's back in the game. Um, the best case scenario is the coach may take the responsibility of removing the player from the game, uh, which generally is going to be on a Friday or Friday night or Saturday. They're pulled from the game because they've sustained the injury. The coach feels they've met their responsibility. But come Monday uh, at 6 o'clock during practice, the kid's back out there banging again. That two-day period from all the research tells you it's not enough. Well, how about this? A coach takes the child out of the game, and I've heard this numerous times, and I'm – I've never personally seen it, but I've heard it numerous times, and I believe that more than likely with your um, uh, involvement, you, you've seen it, the amount of involvement that you have, that you have seen this yourself. Someone is taken out of the game, the parent comes up yelling at the coach, put my child back in, put my child back in. Have you seen that yet? Absolutely. Um, and again, uh, a coach, some of the coaches that I know that, that are the minority, um, that do take this seriously and take the responsibility of the head injury seriously, um, have had, you know, had altercations with parents to say it's not happening. And, and again, when um, you provide the documentation to let them know what the situation is as to why you're not going to do it, the accountability uh, aspect on the coach and the organization, um, you know, then, then more times than not when you have a responsible coach, they're not going to let the kid back in, but it's very, very rare that that occurs. And I've even heard that the parent has said, my son's not playing for you anymore. I'm going to go to a different team where they let him play. Absolutely. And, and to be honest with you, um, I mean, the concussion issue is a serious issue, but you're bringing up a point, too, that has been another pet peeve of mine um, with youth sports probably over the last 10 to 15 years where um, it's – Years and years ago, it was all about community, and you know, you went to school with the kids that you played with. You, you know, you were involved with them. You were involved. Their parents were involved. Today, that's out the window. Um, time and time again, you see uh, kids from all over filtering into what's supposed to be a community boys or girls club, um, and it just doesn't happen anymore. Okay, now you had some information on the helmets and people were doing an argument that they have new helmets out. Well, now, now, please give a, a, the, the, the short answer because yeah. um, we, we came to testify. We don't want to miss that, so we're uh, getting close okay, to our time. Real quick, um, I would just simply say... To, to, well, make sure you give, it a, yeah, no, give two, the information. Two, two, two points, um, because again, that's the expectation today for those who oppose this bill that they're going to talk about helmet technology and tackling techniques and how that's made the game safer. One quick, simple point, you look at the NFL statistics this year, um, NFL concussions are up 13.5%. If you look over a five-year period this past year, the NFL has had more concussions than any other time in that five-year period. So clearly, tackling techniques and helmet technology have not changed anything because if it had, we wouldn't see statistics like that. Number two, um, there is a challenge that the NFL did uh, in 2011, it was awarded in 2015 to a, a company that spun off of uh, the University of Washington, um, and in which case it's called Vixis. Um, definitely on to some interesting possibilities, um, but the point being is, you know, this year they had testing being done uh, at practices at the University of Washington and the University of Oregon, and they had a select uh, amount of NFL players using the helmet so they could get feedback. This is not trickled down to the youth level. In fact, if you look at their website, it clearly states that they're two years away minimum from being able to produce a youth helmet. And if they do produce a youth helmet, then it gets to be an economic question because the helmet currently that they have is $950. Yeah, that's definitely way up there for the leagues that Absolutely. I know. Absolutely. So well, they're thank buying you, helmets that are generally $150 to $300 max. Well, thank you very much, Chris. That was very informative. Appreciate you being here today. All right, let's go get this.